Well, while we're talking about metabolism and changes in a keto diet or for cancer patients uh, specifically, what kind of blood or, or lab or, or body tests do you do typically or do you recommend? And, you know, in the clinical level and the research level, my, my patients ask me, what should they be measuring? Yeah, so I, I think that we don't know all of the right answers yet. Um, but I always do a pretty broad metabolic panel, and I look at the ref I look at the numbers very differently. So we often will get our lab reports from our doctors, and they say everything looks great. And I look at that same lab report, and I think, oh my gosh, we're on fire! Like we need to take a step back, and we need to make some big changes. And in addition, I do order number of labs that are not typically ordered, right? So we always get the CBC and the CMP, um, which are the complete metabolic profile, which interestingly enough, doesn't really show metabolism very well, uh, and, and CBC, but we, they never check insulin. So I look at insulin. I look at IGF one. I use some of the calculators for insulin resistance. So HOMA IR is an integration or a calculation between sugar or glucose and insulin and kind of helps predict for degree of insulin resistance. I use standard labs like a cholesterol panel and look at triglyceride to HDL ratio. Triglycerides, elevated triglycerides, really even over 70 or 100 start to say there's a problem maybe with insulin resistance. Um, and so many of my cancer patients have low HDLs, low vitamin Ds, a lot of association there. Um, but then I look at a few other inflammatory markers. Some people have probably heard of these, um, HSCRP or SED rate, ESR. Um, those are kind of general inflammation markers, but are often elevated in a cancering process. Lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, is really interesting when you look at the Warburg uh, hypothesis or the Warburg effect and how our metabolism funnels through our mitochondria. And when mitochondria are damaged, which is very common in cancer, then LDH, lactate dehydrogenase, has to be upregulated because it's those cancer cells are using the glucose to lactic acid pathway to generate fuel. And they have to do it over and over and over and over again. And LDH is kind of the last enzyme in that process. So when that goes up, it's telling us that, wow, there's a lot of damaged DNA going, or a damaged mitochondria in, in your cellular health, and we need to help repair that. But what has been shown to improve mitochondrial health? Fasting, mimicking diets, fasting, fat burning. Let's push those cells back to health. Um, so that, using a lot of those really give me an overview of where the patient is starting so that we can then go and say, okay, you're eating this way. How are your markers? Are these things getting better? And it's very that, rewarding. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's okay. The LDH will actually be elevated in a, in a regular blood test that we do? Correct. Wow. So yeah, so, yeah, so not, in... I, I will go back to, right, I'm looking at it in a functional medicine perspective, yeah. right? What's what's yeah. the sweet spot? And and even with insulin, there is also too low, right? We, we need glucose. We need insulin. We need all of these pieces, but we really want the Goldilocks, right? We don't want it too cold. We don't want it too hot. We want that sweet spot. So I'm working with patients to try to optimize um, LDH can be too low in people with reactive hypoglycemia. So meaning, you know, elevated insulin. Um, you know, so always really, sweet spot. You're really talking like an obesity medicine doctor, <laughs> which is we're, we're thinking of the insulin and the insulin. Well, and you said IGF-1, that's insulin-like growth Slow factor. factor. And, uh, and then the, the insulin, glucose insulin, diabetes, obesity pathways are the same ones involved with cancer. Yes. And that's why diabetics are at much higher rates or risk of developing a cancer, because really it's the same underlying metabolic problems. Um, but, and it, 
back to why I think obesity is a driver, but it's really what caused that obesity. What's uh, what's the latest thinking about the Warburg effect? So uh, my view is 100 years ago, uh, Otto Warburg described some cancers anyway were pretty much glucose centric. They they liked to have sugar and, and that kind of got amplified into a sugar causes cancer. If you just stop sugar, you'll fix cancer. Well, it's more complicated than that, isn't it? Yes, 100%. But I do think that, um, yes, some cancers have a very strong Warburg, uh, you know, effect. We can see like, in, so it's not so much that sugar feeds cancer, but that when sugar spikes, insulin spikes, insulin binds to the insulin receptors, which pulls that sugar into the cells. And we know that numerous cancers have significantly upregulated the number of insulin and IGF-1 receptors they have on their cell surface. Upregulated, <laughs> upregulated just means there are more of them. More, on yeah. So there was a study back in what, the 90s, early 90s, where they stained breast cancer cells for insulin receptors and found that the average breast cancer cell had six times as many insulin receptors, but up to 24 times as many insulin receptors. And we can see the similar things for prostate, for instance, more common to have elevations in IGF-1 receptors. But very interestingly, if we really dig, they have higher levels of fructose receptors. Um, so there's a lot sugar. of- Again, sugar. <laughs> sugar and different forms of sugar. And really interestingly, from a fructose perspective, like we already know that, oh, high fructose corn syrup, bad, right? I say juicing, bad, right? Giving you more fructose. But interestingly, if you are metabolically broken, i.e. diabetic, pre-diabetic, or even just hyperinsulinemic, you're gonna slowly increase the amount of fructose that you produce inside your body from glucose. So there's a special pathway called the polyol pathway that converts glucose into fructose. And the more problems you have with your metabolism, the more of that conversion you actually make. So you don't even have to eat any fructose, but you're going to be making more from your glucose if you're broken. So it just, there's so many different pieces to the puzzle. The beauty of a ketogenic diet where you're eating real food is that you're kind of removing all of the pieces that can drive. So it's, the the simplistic view is always take away glucose, take away this, take away that, but you can't address it all. And I think the beauty of a ketogenic diet is you tend to address it all with, a, it's not as complicated as we want to make it. And, and from the conventional world and even the alternative world with all the supplements and all of these things, we keep trying to block pathways and and address this one thing in the cancer. And the reason why I think ketogenic diets augment each of those things is really because it's addressing all pieces at the same time. Yeah. And, and I think the general consensus view now, you know, in 2023 is that it, the sugar and ultra processed foods in excess are, drive so many things. It's not, this is a common theme here for cancer too, it seems. It really is. There, there's so much overlap in all of our chronic diseases. And, and sadly, in medical school, we all subspecialized and were, you know, the brain health specialists and the cancer specialists and the obesity specialists. But really, it's the same disease. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.